Hi, Calvary Fellowship. Well, we wrapped up chapter 9 of John last week, and now we're going to enter into chapter 10. Now, this chapter is very closely connected with the last part of chapter 9. And there the Lord Jesus had been speaking to the Pharisees, who claimed to be the rightful shepherds of the people of Israel. Jesus is referring to the religious leaders when he uses this illustration of a thief and a robber seeking to sneak over the wall of the sheepfold. A sheepfold is something that we don't really think about, you know, because we don't deal with sheep very often. A sheepfold was an enclosure which kept the sheep sheltered at night, kept it from wolves getting in or, you know, creatures trying to kill the sheep. It was a safe place. It had an area surrounded by a huge fence that nothing could enter. And having one opening in, in the middle of it was what was used as a door. But there actually wasn't a door there. Many came claiming to be the Messiah to the Jewish people, professing that they had the answers, but they did not come the way the Messiah was supposed to. They were self-appointed. They didn't come the way the Old Testament predicted the Messiah would come. And anyone comes that claims to be the Messiah that does not fulfill what the Old Testament said the Messiah would be cannot be the Messiah. And even today in our times, there have been many that have claimed to be the Messiah, but none of them fit what the Old Testament said the Messiah would be. Let's look. Verse 1, I tell you the truth, anyone who seeks sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. So anyone coming over the sides of the walls is a thief, an imposter, one that wants to do damage. Now, this verse Jesus uses to refer to himself. He came for the lost sheep, the house of Israel. He came in the exact fulfillment of what the Old Testament said would be concerning the Messiah. That's the most important thing to understand. That's the importance, again, of the Old Testament. One of the importances of the Old Testament, but I think one of the greatest importance of the Old Testament are the prophecies of who the Messiah would be, what he would do, and, and that's, to me, my faith builder and who Christ is. He came in perfect obedience to the will of the Father, and he met all of the conditions, and no one ever has, and no one ever will. Only Christ could, and if Jesus did not, nobody will. Time has passed, but he did. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his flock, his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from a stranger because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. He is using terms of their day and their situations to try to help them grasp what he's doing, why he's here that he is the Messiah, what he's called to do. But they didn't get it. So he explained it to them better. I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. Well, hold on, Pastor Dave. You just said Jesus was the shepherd. But here he's talking about being the door. Is he using another comparison? No, he's not. The people of Jesus' day would have understand, they would have understood this perfectly. The sheepfold had no need for doors. Once the sheep came into the fold, what the shepherd would do is he would lay across the opening. He would keep anyone from coming in. He would sleep in that position so that anyone coming in would wake him up. It, it, no one could cross the door. So he became the door. That way no sheep could leave also, and no man could enter. It was protecting those sheep. In referring himself as the door, Jesus is saying, I am the shepherd on duty. I am the one whose job is to guard the flock. We are the flock. The illustration here is the shepherd is the Lord. He's the door. No one can come to us. Nobody can get to us from any other way. He protects us. Verse 8, all who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep 
did not listen to them. And the true sheep are those that are saved, those that have trusted Christ, those that are his. Now, Jesus is primarily referring to the religious leaders of that day. He was not condemning every prophet or servant of God who ever ministered before him on the earth. That's not what he's speaking of here. The religious leaders of that day did not love the sheep. And if you were with us last week, you watched the blind man that could see, and they kick him out of the synagogue because he was healed on the Sunday, because he wouldn't condemn Jesus. Yet here is one of their flock, supposedly, these false leaders, false shepherds, and the man can see for the first time of his life, and, and they, 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 they excommunicate him. The Pharisees were greedy. They even took advantage of the poor widows. They turned God's temple into a den of thieves, we know from the word of God. And they plotted to kill Jesus. Why? Because they didn't want Rome to take away any of their privileges. They were nervous that Rome would do something about Jesus, this Messiah, and maybe get them in trouble. Verse 9, I am the gate. Those who come through me will be saved. And what Jesus is saying is that I am the way to salvation. Can't go around the back door. Can't go over the wall. Can't go a different direction. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. The scriptures that we know by heart. They will come and go freely and will find good pastors. Pastures. As a door, Jesus leads sinners to safety. He leads them into freedom. They have salvation. This word saved is an interesting, we throw it around a lot, but it's an interesting word. It means delivered, safe, and sound. It was used to say that a person had recovered from some severe illness. They were saved from it. They came through a bad storm. They were saved from it. Survived a war. They were saved from. They were acquitted in court. They were saved from. These were all things to use that word has been used for throughout history. Verse 10, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich, satisfying life. The true shepherd came to save the sheep. The Messiah came to save his people. But the false shepherd took advantage of the sheep and exploited them. And, and it happens today. It happens today. It's been exposed today. It's embarrassing what happens in the name of religion. Prayer handkerchiefs that are supposed to pay money and they pray and they find them in dumpsters, you know, and just the nonsense, taking advantage of people, taking advantage of widows, you know, stealing from the poor, stealing from anyone. Behind these false shepherds is a thief. And I'm sure what we're talking about here is a reference to Satan himself. He's the driving force to this greed and this wickedness. And the thief wants to steal the sheep. He wants to take them out of the fold. He wants to remove them from their safety. He wants to slaughter them. He wants to destroy them. Satan hates human beings. He hates that we're favored by God. He hates God. He was a, an angel. We're told beautiful, leader of worship, highest position in heaven. And he allowed pride. He wanted to be as God. And he was a created being. And the wickedness destroyed him. And it destroys people today. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The word translated good it means essentially good, everything about you, beautiful, fair. It describes that which is ideal. Our Lord's goodness was inherent to his nature. To call him good was the same as calling him God. And we remember back in Mark 10, 17, the rich, the rich young man. Let me read it. As Jesus started out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This term, good teacher, had very a lot of power in it. Why do you call me good, Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. And what Jesus is doing there is he's saying, 
you're calling me good. And only God is good. So do you realize that you have put me in the position of God? That is who I am. He's helping him to understand that in that situation. Back to the scriptures. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. He dies for the sheep. Under the old disposition, dispensation, the sheep died for the shepherd. In the Old Testament, a sheep was slaughtered and his blood covered the sin. The shepherd raised sheep to slaughter them. But now the good shepherd dies for the sheep. Christ being the good shepherd was slaughtered and his blood was shed for our sins once and forever. It's a gorgeous picture of what he's done for us. Five times in the sermon, Jesus clearly affirms the sacrificial nature of his death. He's willing to lay down his life for us, which he did. And no one can love you more to give their very life for you. And that's what our God has done. Verse 12, a hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him. And he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I think that there are far too many people in ministry today that are only in it for the money. I remember talking to a young man that just came out of seminary. And I asked him, I said, what are you going to do now that you've come out of seminary? He goes, well, I'm going to pastor a church. And I said, okay, but until that happens, where will you serve? What are you doing? He goes, I went to seminary. I'm going to pastor a church. And so I'm going to make a living. And I, and, I, and I kept saying, but until that happens, where are you going to serve? What are you going to do? I, I'm not going to do anything until I pastor a church. I went to seminary. I'm supposed to pastor a church. And, and I just couldn't help but understand, help but try to figure out, what's this guy going to go through? You know, the, um, he went to seminary for a position before he even knew what the calling was about or had any experience. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. When someone tries Christ as their Lord, it's a beautiful picture because they know the voice of the Lord. And it just confirms that they are his. The word know means much more than an intellectual awareness. Satan knows who God is. It speaks of an intimate relationship between God and his people. Isn't it wonderful that the Lord knows our names? Well, it's even better is he knows our nature. Even though they all are sheep here, they have their own distinct characteristics, just like we do. And the caring shepherd recognizes these traits. He knows the weaknesses. He knows the strengths. Some sheep are afraid of high places. Others, dark shadows. Others, water. But the faithful shepherd knows what to do with the sheep of his flock. He knows how to protect them. He knows how to guide them through those difficulties. If you're in a difficulty in your life right now, the Lord understands that difficulty in your life. And he's a good shepherd, and he wants to be there for you. And all you have to do is put your faith in him. Now, it doesn't, it's not a magical formula for everything to be right or everything to be better. Heaven, everything's going to be right, and everything's going to be better. And that's what we rest in. Ultimately, God will heal everything that this world has, every disease and everything, with this new body that we have. Because God knows our natures, he also knows our needs. Most of the time, we don't even know our own needs. I love Psalm 23. Valerie shared it as the opening prayer. And it's a beautiful description of how the good shepherd cares for his sheep. And it's one when I do a service, I, I do that, and I help people to understand what's going on in this prayer. But that's a whole sermon in itself. But let's look at how the beauty of the prayer just as it sits. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. See, a rough stream would scare a sheep. He renews my strength. Why? Because it falls. 
that needs to be renewed. He guides me along right paths. He brings honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are as close beside me. You are close beside me. Your rod and staff protect me and comfort me. Your, your discipline protects me. Your discipline, dis, discipline keeps me on the straight and narrow. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. Anything against me, you have me covered. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. They would anoint the heads with oil and it would keep the bugs out of the eyes or infesting into their open wounds. My cup overflows with blessings. I'm blessed beyond my imagination being yours. Surely goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. I am loved forever as his child and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. I have eternity waiting for me. As a shepherd cares for the sheep, the sheep get to know the shepherd better. The good shepherd knows his sheep and his sheep know him. They get to know him better by listening to his voice. What are we talking about here? We're talking about praying and being in his word. The Bible is God's voice to us and experiencing his daily care. How many times has God protected us throughout this day and we don't even know about it? As the sheep follow the shepherd, they learn to love and trust him. The longer you walk with the Lord, the stronger your faith should be. You go back to all those times it looked impossible, all those times it looked overwhelming, all those times that you were fretting, and he took you through it. He loves his own, and he shows that love in the way he cares for them. Look, because we're Christians doesn't mean that life is going to be easy for us. There are trials and tribulations in this world. It's a fallen world that we live in. But those that are his will have eternity with never having a trial or a tribulation again. The promise of God is what gets us through any type of difficulty we have in this world. And as I shared a week or two ago, difficulties are our, it's an honor to glorify God through difficulties. It inspires those around us that we can have faith through difficulties. Verse 15, just as my father knows me and I know the father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not in the sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. This is really good theology here. We see Jesus made it clear that the sheep up to this point are the nation of Israel. They were God's chosen people. The Gentiles, like us that are not Jewish, are the other sheep that he's speaking of. And they will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. You know, this is beautiful theology. It's what's going to happen. You know, Israel was God's chosen people. When they rejected Christ, it opened the door for you and me to trust Christ. And one day we'll be all one under one shepherd. God has his people all over the world. And he's going to call them and gather them together. And he will bring Israel back into the sheepfold again. Throughout Israel's history, because of their rejection, because of their disobedience, there's been separation between them and God. It's discipline. But when they see Christ in the middle of that tribulation time, when the Antichrist steps in, three and a half years and claims to be worshiped and does an abomination and their eyes are opened again, Israel will say, what have we done? And they will see Christ for who he is. And then the sheepfold will be built again with everyone that's God's children. The father loves me because I sacrificed my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrificed it voluntarily, and we know that because any time they tried, and they will in a minute, to grab Jesus, it wasn't until the Passover time that Jesus would die for our sins. They couldn't touch him. How could one man be right in between the Roman army and, and the temple guards and, and, and just walk right through him? It was miraculous, but, but God was not going to have Jesus touched until the exact time that he was to sacrifice himself for us. 
For I have the authority to lay it down when I want, and also to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. When he said these things, the people were again divided in their opinion about him. Some said he's demon-possessed, out of his mind. Why listen to a man like that? Others said, this doesn't sound like a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And see, not everybody rejected Christ. Those that read the Old Testament with an open mind and an open heart knew that the Messiah would open the eyes of the blind. In the last chapter, Jesus did that. And, and with proof of it, the religious leaders rejected it. They just, they, they could not get beyond their willful disobedience. Notice the word there again. The same accusations that were on Jesus about being demon-possessed and, and out of his mind are happening again. You know, have you ever noticed that people will almost say or do anything to avoid facing truth? It's mind-boggling to me the things that they will say rather than face the truth. Since Jesus is the door, we would expect a division because the door shuts some people in and others out. He is a good shepherd, and the shepherd must separate the sheep from the goats. Christ Jesus separates. There is division. There are sheep, which are his children, and there are goats that are not. Well, Pastor, that's not nice to say about anyone. It's the word of God. Apart from trusting Christ, you're a goat. You're walking dead. It's not to insult you. It's to encourage you to get alive, become a sheep, become a child of God. Why do you want to be a goat? It's impossible to stay neutral about Jesus because what we believe about him is a matter of life and death. And we see these people looking at the three options, and you hear me share it at the time. What we have to do with Christ after hearing about him, we have to either say that he was a liar, demon-possessed, or we have to say he was a lunatic out of his mind, or we have to admit that he is Lord. And I'm in awe of how many people would rather have him be a liar or a lunatic instead of Lord after everything he did to prove who he is. Now, his third declaration was the most startling of all. Verse 22, it was now winter, and Jesus was in Jerusalem at the time of the Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. The event in this section occurs about two and a half months after what we were reading in um, verse 21. John put them together because both messages uses Jesus' imagery of the shepherd and the sheep. He was in the temple, walking through the section known as the Solomon's Colonnade. The people surrounded him and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Now, he's done nothing but do that up to this point. Many, many times people ask questions not because they want to know the answer, but they want to argue. I always know when someone does that. I can get the phone call, and they'll act like they're asking a question about a scripture, and they know what kind of division they're talking about when they read that scripture. And so what they want to do is they want to have a debate with me. They want to have an argument with me. And what I'll do is I'll tell them, you know, um, go online to Calvary Chapel, and Pastor Chuck does a credible sermon exactly on what you're asking. No, 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 I don't want, I want to talk to you about, you know, and, you'll, and, I'm, go, and I'm going, you know what, I'm not going to argue with you. You know, if you truly want to know the answer, it, it, I've never heard it explained any better. And they get mad and they start screaming. I've even had them cuss me out. They, they want to argue. They don't want to know. And that's what's happening here, that he has made it plain and clear all along. What's going on here is they want to kill him. They want to hear it again so they can have a reason to kill him. Jesus replied, I've already told you, and you don't believe me. The proof is in the work I do in my Father's name. But you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. <laughs> You're the goats. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You see the illustration now? Do you see how it comes together? Who is Christ and who is not? He reminds them of what he had already told them. His words and his work were the living proof that he was the Messiah. 
He revealed to the Jewish leaders why they did not understand or grasp the significance of his work. They were not his sheep. And anyone that wants to argue who Christ is and what God's done for them, they're just not God's sheep. You're dealing with goats. And we don't become arrogant. We don't become rude. We pray for those people. We pray for their eyes to be open. We pray that anything that binds them would be removed. We pray for people to come around them with truth and that they would be willing to open their minds and their eyes and their heart to the truth. But um, you're not going to argue anybody into heaven. You're just not going to. I've tried. I've debated till it hurt. And all they want to do is debate. You know, from a human standpoint, this is always interesting. We become a sheep by believing. But from a divine standpoint, we believe because we are his sheep. Romans 11.33 tells us, Oh, how great are the God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. I have met those that want to absolutely be able to explain everything of God and think that they can when the word of God doesn't even give us those answers. There are things that we won't know till we get to heaven. And that's okay with me. It's okay with me that God is bigger than everything I can know. But the Bible tells us one day we will know. You know, I think, I think about this all the time. Um, most of us don't use 10% of the brain. Some of us far less than that. The brain was capable of 100%. Why we don't have 100%, no one really knows for sure. I truly think that that's what happened during the fall. I think Adam and Eve had 100%. They could connect with God on a different level than we can. So that they could walk with God and, and, and have conversations with God in the cool of day. They had an intellect that was able to speak to God in a way that we don't. Adam could name every single creature. I can't name four creatures. You know, the, the memory, the ability, the things they had. When sin came into the world, I think 90% of the man's mind was taken away. I think someday I, with this new body, I think we get all of it. And I think we need that just to be able to be in awe of who God is. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay them back? None of us. For everything comes from him and exists by his power and, his, and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. I love that. God has his sheep. He knows who they are. They will hear his voice and they're going to respond. In the Bible, divine election and human responsibility are perfectly balanced. If you go one extreme or the other, you will not be balanced. Why do you want to unbalance something that God has given us in balance? I am... Um, I cannot move to the area of, of full Calvinism. The man has no choice. That God created them to be damned. It isn't God, for, God wants for all to be saved. The, too many scriptures keep you from taking that hard line. And I've met those that won't pull off of that hard line. And, you know, if you want to believe that, that's fine. But that isn't good enough for them. And, and I've lost friendships over it and it's heartbreaking and I said look we can just agree to disagree but you can't tell me that I have to believe that I believe that God knows who will be saved and who will not because he knows everything but I think that choice has been given to us right from the very beginning Adam and Eve had the ability to choose the apple or whatever the piece of fruit was or not choose it and they chose poorly and I think we have the opportunity to choose the Lord, but he knew who would choose him and who wouldn't choose him. And it's okay with me that this is bigger than what I can grasp. I'm just glad that I've been chosen. I'm just glad that I chose him. I'm just glad to be his child. I'm his sheep. And that he protects me and he loves me and he died for me. 
And I want for everyone, I want for all to be saved. It's my desire. But I can't force anyone. I can't make anyone. All I can do is pray for them and try to live a life that brings God honor and glory. Your greatest witness is your life, folks. Your great, if you live in one direction and one way outside of the church and another way inside the church, your testimony's shot. You're no good to God. There's nothing attractive about that. There's nothing you can put your faith in in that. Verse 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. That's the promise we have. No one can snatch them away from me. If you are a child of God, you cannot be snatched away. Isn't that a great feeling? You know, imagine if we had to fear every day that the devil could steal us away from God. If you're his child, you're going to do what's right. For my father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. You know, sometimes people want to put Satan on a, a level of God. He's not even close. He's not even close. He's, he, he's, he's, he's dust compared to the Lord. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. Jesus went on to explain that his sheep are secure in his hand and in the Father's hand, and they should never perish. It's his promise. The false shepherds bring destruction, but the good shepherd, shepherd sees to it that his sheep shall never perish. These are promises from the Lord himself. Oh, it's important to understand that Jesus was talking about sheep. And these are true believers, not counterfeits. The illustration in 2 Peter 20, 2.20 of a wild scavenger dog and a pig will return to their own vomit. They will return to their own sin. But his sheep are not scavenger dogs. They're not pigs, unclean animals. His sheep will follow the good shepherd into green pastures. In that 2 Peter 2.20, it's one of my very favorite sermons to teach because it talks about a dog returning to its vomit, a pig returning to a slop. That's what it is for someone to claim that they're a Christian and return back into a sinful life. It, it, unclean animals were used. And, you know, we, we have a hard time with uh, whenever we see dog, and that's why I use wild scavenger dog. Those dogs were, um, you know, they would eat the flesh of the things in the dumps. I mean, they were, they were filthy animals. They're not like our little pets, our, our little foo-foos that we have that we spend more on than we do our children. Um, you know, it was a different kind of... So the idea dog is totally different than our dogs that we have. They were wild beasts. Verse 30, the father and I are one. <laughs> Here's the plain answer. This is what the religious leaders asked for. I am... I and my Father are one. It's clear as a statement as Jesus could make. This was even stronger than a statement that he had said that he came down from heaven and he existed before Abraham, as we saw earlier. It's, it's way stronger. Jesus here is claiming what is rightfully his claim, and that's equality with God. In Philippians 2, 6, we read that he who was in the beginning with God and thought it not robbery or something to be grasped to be equal with God. And the statement here, I and the Father are one, he's claiming equality with God. He's claiming deity. The religious leaders understood the claim, and to them it was blasphemy. And they were ready to stone him, according to their understanding of the law for blasphemy. There are people that read the word of God, theologians, that say that Jesus never claimed to be God. There are false religions that claim that Jesus never said that he was God. I don't know what they do with this verse and so many other. I don't know how they, do they just ignore them? How can you look at this and not see that? How can they miss what these religious leaders certainly did not miss? Now, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word name, when it refers to God, never once appears in the plural. Never. It's always in the singular. It is the name of the Father, not names of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but the name singularly. It is a true triunal or three-in-one thought. I'm going to give you an illustration 
that I read that I thought was brilliant. And suppose I had a can of paint here, and it's mixed with red, white, and blue paint in the same can. And then I also had three separate cans, one red, one white, and one blue. If I were gonna dip a block of wood into these cans, and I wanted to describe it without showing you, I would phrase my sentence in English like this. I'm going to dip this block of wood into a can of red, blue, and white paint. You would know that one can mixed with three paints is what I was doing. Try unity. Now, what if I wanted to say I'm going to dip this block of wood in each of those cans? How would I say this? Well, this is how I would say it. I'm going to dip this block of wood in a can of red paint and a can of white paint and a can of blue paint. And then you would know there were th three separate types of cans of paint. What we have in Matthew 28, 19, therefore go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. This is the first can I was describing. It's with the red, white, and blue inside of it. It's not called the names. The word name is not repeated. It does not say in the name of the Father and the name of the Son and the name of the Spirit. It does not say that because the Bible never treats the name of God that way. It never does. The Lord our God is one Lord. It's in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the best descriptions of what's being said about God. Verse 31. Once again, the people picked up stones to kill him. Jesus said, at my father's direction, I have done many good works. For which one are you going to stone me? They replied, we're stoning you not for any good work, but for blasphemy. You're a mere man claiming to be God. What in the world are those people that are saying that Jesus never claimed to be God reading when they read this? I, I don't understand. I, a, a, a child could read this and understand this. Jesus replied, it is written in your own scriptures that God said to certain leaders of the people, I say, you are God, small g, and you know that scriptures cannot be altered. I, I love this because it's important that Jesus clearly points to the inherency of the Bible. Scriptures cannot be altered. They're real, they're true, the same. They've never been, God's word's always the same. So if those people who received God's message were called God, small g, that's what leaders, judges, and things were called, why do you call it blasphemy when I say I am the Son of God? After all, the Father sent me apart and sent me into the world. The Lord's arguing from lesser to greater. If unjust judges were called gods, if human beings in the Old Testament, how much more right did he have to say that he was the Son of God when he has come and done everything the Son of God was supposed to do? He's basically using their logic on them. He's taking the smallest deal, detail to prove this point. Since the inherency of the Bible called their judges gods, the Jews could not logically accuse Jesus of blasphemy for calling himself the Son of God. After all, the Father sent me apart and sent me into the world. Verse 37, don't believe me unless I carry out my father's work. Christ is being really honest. If I've not done what the Old Testament said I would do, if I've not done what only God could do, then don't believe me. You'd have a right not to. But if I do his work, which he did, believe in the evidence of the miraculous work I have done. Even if you don't believe me, then you will know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. You know, when we looked at Nicodemus, he realized this, for he said, no one could perform these miraculous signs if God were not with him. Nicodemus was one of the religious leaders. But Nicodemus saw the basic fundamental facts that this man has done what no human being could do. This man is doing what was said of the Messiah. He knew that the rest of them were willfully blind to the truth. 
Verse 39, once again they tried to arrest him, but he got away and left them. Again, any attempt that was made to seize him before he was supposed to go was not possible, again, because it wasn't God's timing. Verse 40, he went beyond the Jordan River near a place where John was first baptizing, and he stayed there a while. Many followed him. John didn't perform miraculous signs. It's interesting. They remarked to one another, but everything he said about this man has come true, and many who were there believed in Jesus. I think this is an incredible, as I'm closing, tribute to John the Baptist. John the Baptist didn't need fancy buildings. He didn't need to wear fancy clothes. He didn't have to have incredible sound systems. He didn't have to have a television ministry. He didn't have to have, you know, great riches. And, and, and he didn't have to reach the relevant of the day. He didn't have to do anything but share who Christ is simply and plainly. That was his job. Today, we are tempted to think that we have to compete with the world. We have to compete with the rock stars and the superstars, and we have to have, you know, the flashing lights and the sound systems and the fireworks and the smoke machines, and we have to compete with the world so that the world can see who our God is. John the Baptist didn't. And we can see that his simplicity and him speaking of who Christ was was what it took for people to be saved. You know, here at Calvary Fellowship, I mean, we meet in a gymnasium. There's no buildings in Discovery Bay. When we got put out of there, we met in a field. When that didn't work anymore, we met out in a parking lot. And today we bring our own chairs and wear masks and sing under our breaths, whatever it takes. I'm uh, I'm not you know, running smoke machines and million dollar stained glass windows and unlimited budgets and eloquent or entertaining or any of the things that people think you have to have to be effective. We have simply directed people to who Jesus Christ is and what it is to be a Christian and what it is to live a Christian life and where the power of God is critical for doing that. The simplicity of what we've done here for the last close to 20 years and the lives that have been changed. And it's always encouraging to see that God will take something like that and use it to his glory. That's what we want, that's what we're after. It's so easy to get caught up in the world and what the world's doing. It's so easy to think that we have to be doing that too. Think about the simplicity of God himself coming into the world. You know? He comes in the world and he's not a rhinestone cowboy. You know what I mean? He comes in the world and he doesn't come as a rich sheik or he doesn't come into the world as, you know, the wealthiest man or he comes without anything, born in a manger to the poorest of families. He comes into the world without any of the strength and power and temple and all the things of the religious leader, all the money and the robes and the flowing robes and the jewelry and the gold and all the things that they had. And, and, and he, he comes in the world in the simplicity of, uh, of a poor man. But sharing the truth, sharing it in a way that people can understand it, in the way that they live, with the things that they were living and, and people's lives changing. You think about the disciples. I mean, those disciples changed the face of the earth. We today are children of God because of the faithfulness of Jesus' simple teaching. And so it's always important for us to remember that it's the word of God and the power of God that makes the difference. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have smoke machines and all the stuff that goes with it, but I think that we have to be careful that we're not drawing people to smoke machines and lights 
and not drawing them to God and living a simple, obedient life. We can't do any better than living a simple, obedient life. And that's what's going to win others. It's going to be the peace that we have, especially as the world we have where all those things are starting to fall apart. When we have the joy because we have eternity, we have the Lord, and the world is just panicking because all those things that they thought were important are melting away. It's a great testimony, you guys, to the God that we serve. God bless you guys. I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Whoa. May the Lord bless you, may he keep you, may your week with him be sweet and tender. Father, please quiet us down. Help us to spend more time with you. Remind us, Lord, tap on our shoulders. Remind us to be in your word. Remind us just to talk to you, Lord. It's always so much better after we've talked to you. Lord, I pray for those that are afraid to pray or think that they don't pray good or they're not eloquent or anything, Lord, that you would help them to understand that you gave them the voice that they have and you love that voice. You love the way that they speak. You love the way they think. You know your sheep and you love your sheep for who they are and they would just come to you the way that they are, not pray like somebody else prays. Pray like they talk to you, Lord. Help them to understand how important that is. And Father, don't let us get up in the morning. Don't let these feet touch the ground 
until we've asked you to fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that's what enables us to live this life as your children. We're your children because of what you've done, and we've trusted that. But we want to be obedient children, Lord. We want to live under the power of your Holy Spirit that dwells in us. So remind us, Lord, to ask for that, and then ask for it over and over and over again so that we continue to be the people that you want us to be, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. God bless you guys.